Jonathan Edwards and welcome to today's masterclass. This is translating your photography skills to film and cinema photography. Today we're going to get a taste of what it's like to be a pro filmmaker and learn how your photography skills will benefit you with video work. We're going to look at noticeable differences between the two art forms from movement, stabilization, storytelling to lighting, editing and color grading. Discussing work styles uh, and building techniques and shooting um, right through to color grading techniques. Uh, what will set you apart in a huge market? Social media, marketing and brand awareness. Um, building an online presence, having a face or a kind of brand to your business or company um, and what will set you apart in a huge market and make clients return. So a brief introduction to myself. I'm Jonathan Edwards. I'm 36 years old. I'm from North Wales. Um, I guess I first kind of realised I was keen or, or cinema photography and film might be a job was uh, I, I won a Sony award in 2013. Um, it was the Sony Pro Production Awards. I entered a short um, skate park uh, kind of commercial I'd made and I honestly thought it would go nowhere at all. But I entered it, it got through to the final in the commercial sector uh, and I was lucky enough to win. And from that, I received a huge amount of support from Sony. Um, the FS700 camera at the time, that was the first kind of prosumer camera that did uh, higher frame rate recording and slow motion. And from there, also training at Pinewood Studios and various courses uh, on lighting, um, cinema photography, and color grading at Pinewood Studios. From there, I kind of went on to uh, work with Sony, uh, supplied them film stock, uh, I got signed to Getty Images, and then along the way I also became an ambassador for Zeiss Lenses and Hoyer Filters. International clients or selected clients, I guess, that we've worked with are Adidas, Zeiss, Mercedes, uh, Conor Nass, Heisner Variety, JD Sports, uh, Jason Marks, Raised by Walls, Foot Locker, The North Face, uh, and I'll give examples of some of our, our, our commercial work throughout this presentation. So I guess the first thing to show would be our showreel. This is our 2019 commercial reel, uh, or anthem reel as we've called it. Um, so this is a whole year of content sliced down into one minute. And we'd use this to email across to potential clients and uh, brands and businesses. And I guess the idea of the reel, or at least for us, is that it really screams who we are and what we're about right through from the music we select for it to the sound design for it the color grading, uh, how fast it's cut, and the techniques. Um, you know, it's kind of a highlight of what we've done with our year and uh, why you might or hopefully employ us. So that's the anthem reel. Um, I guess it's one of those where you have so much content and so much to go through to create something like that. Um, you have to be really picky and really slice it back to bare bones of what were the best shots, what really kind of made each film uh, throughout the year. Um, I guess to coin a phrase, uh, murder my darling is a perfect one. So, you know, you might have the most beautiful clip ever, but you really need to take it down to maybe half a second or a second rather than five or 10 seconds because it's gonna be on screen too long for something like a minute edit. So moving forward now, we're gonna talk about scouting. With this masterclass, I thought the best way to go about it, um, if you're a photographer coming into videography, was that if I kind of went through start to finish how we kind of go about a project now. And I suppose how I have from the start from what I'd read online. So I hope that helps fast track people and you kind of work out where you can weave photography already into the idea of working with videography or picking up a camera 
and just going out and shooting some video work. Firstly, scouting. Scouting is super important. Um, it's something I pride myself on hugely. I always like to go out and see sites before we shoot anywhere. Even if we're shooting abroad uh, for a brand, we'll fly in advance and go early and have a couple of days of walking around sites and looking at key factors uh, for film work. So for example, uh, in the images on the slide, the top three are a quarry in North Wales that we shot a project in. So beforehand, I went and walked the site and we're looking for little things like, where does the sun come up and where does the sun set? So where are we going to start the project and where are we going to end the project? You know, do we want a sunset? Do we want a sunrise? Um, what's the middle of the day going to be like? Is there anywhere interesting to film when the sun is really high? The middle shots are uh, some shots in Italy. Uh, we went to the Amalfi Coast to shoot a, a project for a fashion brand. And again, we visited the two towns that we shot in uh, in advance and boxed off some key areas that we wanted to shoot saw whether we were able to shoot on the beach. Um, it was a smaller brand, so we didn't have permits. So we kind of had to work our way around that. And lower images are within a mine in North Wales. That kind of started as a personal project, uh, which was more photography based, uh, long exposures with some LED lighting in pitch black mines and kind of grew legs to the point that I thought, actually, if we brought enough kit and had a big enough team, we could actually do a fashion shoot in a mine, which I thought was really cool and something I'd never seen anyone do. So again, kind of weaving the two together. And again, when we go to each of these sites to uh, scout, I normally take a stills camera and I will take images for reference, but further to that, they're normally really cool sites, or I hope they are, because that's the whole reason why we've traveled there or want to shoot there. And um, I'll shoot landscape, photography and images along the way, which are then references for the brands, references for ourselves, and also I then send them off to Zeiss, Sony, Hoya, etc. as uh, some social content as well. So it's kind of a, a nice win-win, a double up on that. So moving on, I thought we'd go into a film project. This was JD Sports Lisbon Autumn Winter Campaign 2018. Um, really cool project. Massive crew behind it. I'll explain more after the video. So um, yeah, JD Sports Lisbon. So that was the JD Sports Lisbon project and uh, that nicely kind of leads me now into producing and directing. So I guess just to break something down, I'll give you an example of a much larger production project like that for us. So that project was up to uh, kind of broadcast TV level, uh, which meant that we had a much bigger team and also alongside Naive, which was myself, uh, the photographer I worked with Jacob. Uh, a lighting and digi that we brought in was also a, a separate production team that were on hand to kind of support us. So that, that gave us runners, assistants, um, vans and, and driving crew to and from location, catering on site, um, gear rental, and um, yeah, just, just lots of extra little things that you might not need initially in the first smaller projects, but as the projects get bigger and the shoots get bigger uh, and the demands get higher, uh, things like this are needed and, and come in more and more. So yeah, for example, with that project, JD Sports had chosen the locations uh, and the initial idea to go with the clothing uh, via the marketing team. We were brought in for a meeting to discuss through the project uh, that we agreed it was a cool location and we liked the models and all the rest of it. We then kind of went away and brainstormed ideas, um, storyboards, mood boards on how we'd go about it. And then from there, the project grew legs and we flew out to Lisbon 
and shot the project. I guess by then as well, it was our third project with JD Sports on seasonal campaigns. So everyone had kind of built a good working relationship and we knew what everyone was about and how things worked. It was much easier than say the first project that was in Miami, um, which was a very steep learning curve, I guess, on a new client and how they work or, or how they want to go about things. Yeah, so essentially JD Sports were producing that project. Myself and Jacob were directing the project jointly and then uh, we had a production team behind us as well. Same again in Miami. So talking a little bit further about producing and directing, you can really strip it back and I guess that's why in these lower two images here for a brand called For Those Who Sin in LA, uh, we shot that whole project and it was a large campaign across three days with simply the model, the brand owner, and then Jacob and myself, and that was it. So it was on a really small budget, but it was a really, really cool project when he came to us with the idea and we jumped on that and we went with it and um, it was really good. We shot in the desert, uh, we shot in LA, uh, we shot in Hollywood Hills. And it's really tasking and really hard work when you're used to having runners and assistants. But at the same time, the results were great. It was something we wanted in our portfolio. So, you know, it's kind of going that extra mile and doing something for yourself. And I guess clawing back, it was, it was almost like a branded personal project in a way. Um, and from there, we went on to um, put that into film festivals. But yeah, essentially, again, with uh, producing and directing, I've also done projects where I've decided I was gonna go on a small vacation or holiday with my wife and to produce some further content or be involved further with Zeiss. I've uh, kind of took it upon ourselves to make a little holiday, uh, not really a tourist or travel explorer type video because that's not really my thing, but just more like a little cinematic piece of somewhere we've been. So we've done ones for Las Vegas, we've done ones for Venice, um, we've done ones for Nevada and um, yeah, as much as my wife will put up with me at the time, we will kind of run through and shoot in between enjoying ourselves, going out for food or whatever we might be doing. Or even sometimes, yeah, I think to begin with, I documented some of that stuff. So I guess in essence, coming from photography and shooting projects, um, personal projects in photography or um, campaigns, this can work the same again, where you can kind of pitch an idea or you can produce and direct your own content. And I think really, there's no problem in that at all and um, it leads to almost better work because it, it minuses out the client a lot of the time which can be great and can be a nightmare at the same time. I think there's nothing better than coming back to some personal projects and, and you know creating some work that really screams you. So moving on now um, we're going to look at a film this is for Hype the clothing brand uh, which is they're based in the UK but they're an international clothing brand now and uh, they do a lot of collaborations. Um, this one in particular is with Sony PlayStation and um, it was a great project. A lot of props brought in from PlayStation. Um, I guess when they collaborated with them, PlayStation have a lot of uh, kind of install displays, uh, pieces for collaborations like this. So we had some large PlayStation letters, uh, some additional lighting, um, some more budget for the models. And uh, we spent one day building the set and then one day shooting the project across stills and film. And um, it's a great project. I work a lot with Hype. I really like the brand. I really like the creative team. Um, it's kind of a cool working relationship as well where Jacob that I work with comes in and is lighting tech on the project. So um, yeah, it kind of all just kind of comes together and, and I feel like it's, it's constantly uh, uh, great projects to be involved with. So that was the high PlayStation film. Um, technically, it was quite a hard um, project 
because we had lots of additional uh, kind of items on set. So we had kind of the neon letters in the background. We had um, some LED lit symbols as well, which obviously don't flicker, whereas the neon lights did. So that was kind of hard to work around the two. I split the set in half and shot half of it in normal speed. And then the second half of the project with the bigger letters in slow motion with additional lighting. And then also, as you could see across the models, we had a 10K projector, uh, which was crazy. It's more like the kind of projector that you'd use for a stadium or something. Um, but we wanted it really crisp, so we set that to the back of the room and pushed the PlayStation symbols across the models um, as they modeled the garments and did the movements that I wanted for the film work. Um, so lots and lots of aspects to kind of take in and make sure we're correct uh, when we shot on the day itself. So moving on, we're going to talk about shooting and obviously if you work in a smaller team this means that you're going to take on everything and as you can see in some of the images here so the top shots, uh, that was just a, a personal project with a skateboarder at a local uh, skate park, the Boneyard, ridden for years on a bike um, the middle shots were a project for uh, Jesse Lingard's brand, J Lings uh, that was shot in Manchester at a small studio a great project with a great selection of models we kind of went through a range of work with them and kind of really kind of capturing their character I guess the caption for the brands be yourself so it was really kind of bringing out the best of the models and getting a lot of energetic movement and personality out of each of them and then the lower shots there much much bigger campaign JD Sports Christmas uh, TV ad and that was working with Anthony Joshua very large set we weren't shooting the TV campaign itself, but we were doing the social content. But again, very exciting. We met a wide range of celebrities from Jaden Smith. Jesse Lingard, again, strangely, was back on set. But yeah, a, a really good project and a, a real learning curve for us as well to be on such a, a big set like that. So yeah, talking about shooting, um, framing shots. I guess if you're coming from a photography background, that's kind of easy, you know, because obviously you have a shooting style, uh, you know rule of thirds and symmetry and so on so you know you can bring those styles and those aspects to your film work as well I guess I kind of got interested in photography more so uh, the after after college and university the second time around with um, the whole kind of street photography boom on Instagram so via hype beast and trash hand and so on and so from practicing stuff like symmetry and thirds and street shooting I feel like I kind of tried to bring that to my fashion work in the film work. Um, and I've heard that mentioned by various people as well. So yeah, uh, don't be shy to, to push that across into the film work, you know? I mean, a lot of the time now with the smaller cameras we're using, we use a lot of the Sony Alpha cameras, you know, you can shoot great stills and great video on them. So you can use that across the two. And then the same again with the lenses. Uh, we work obviously a lot with the Zeiss lenses, we work with the Batis range and we work with the Loxy range. And again, they're, they're, they're both great for stills and for cinema photography and film. So again, um, it's kind of having the same gear in hands and being so used to it that it's, it's kind of very fluid and you can switch across the two very quickly on projects. Yeah, so going on to camera operating. So currently, I've got some cameras here. So We've used a few larger Cine cameras before. This is the Sony uh, FS5 Mark II, and that's paired up. Currently, we've got a Zeiss 85 on there from a recent personal project. Um, I've got the 85 on because I was doing a lot of more handheld close-up work on this to bring some personality and life to the project. And then our current go-to workhorse, really, uh, as small and as cheap as it is, is the Sony a7 III and this is paired up currently with another workhorse which is the Zeiss Loxia 35mm which I feel is great it's it's kind of semi-wide but it there's no distortion on it um, it's more of a cine style lens um, it's manual focus it's really fast it's down to f2 and um, yeah it just works really well with this camera the camera does great slow motion it's got s-log2 and s-log3 we always shoot s-log3 I know a lot of people aren't into that but I think it grades much better and um, yeah, again, you know, you can flip between stills and video with this and you can get great results with both. So lighting is another uh, key aspect, I guess, of film work, which is kind of different to stills. Uh, continuous lighting is, uh, 
not so much a problem, but um, can be very expensive. Um, light panels are getting cheaper, and um, currently we use uh, Aperture uh, 120D Mark IIs. We've got two of those. Um, they're great lights, um, they're very bright. Obviously there's other companies out there, Rotolite make great lights, uh, Manfrotto have dipped in and made lights now. Um, there's plenty out there, but yeah, the lighting, I guess again, you can see on some of these projects here with JD, uh, on a larger campaign like this, I think there was about 20 to 30 lights on that set. And these are all ARRI panels, which are ultra expensive. So there's ARRI sky panels here, uh, I did hear actually that the, the largest panel in the roof is the only one in the country. It costs that much. And then there's about another 10 to 15 lights dotted behind the back of this um, set to uh, light up Anthony Joshua as well as he's in the foreground and these above him. So sound capture. Um, obviously again, um, sound is very dangerous. I feel like a massive pitfall that people forget about. Um, I remember one of my old bosses when I worked full time said to me, you know, if anything's gonna go wrong with video, it's the sound. And I feel he's so right on that. So currently we run some Rode mics. So we run the Rode lav kit, which is great, which I, I'm actually doing this um, talk on here. And um, we also run the Rode Video Mic Pro X, which is more like a ball device, and that sucks in all ambient sound 360 on shoots. Um, so obviously you have to kind of be aware of that and call quiet on set, but um, it's a really, really good mic to use because kind of, you, you, you know, you're really sucking in. So if you're working in a, a wood like I have been lately, um, you can really hear all the noise and you feel like you're there when you hear it back in post. Um, it's a broadcast quality mic, um, super, super good, and I highly recommend that. The obvious go-to, I guess, if you're starting out, is a shotgun mic. Uh, again, I, I don't want to plug Rode too much, but again, they make a good shotgun mic. Sennheiser, again, make really good mics. And lastly, working with talent. So working with talent, as I said, with uh, Jesse Lingard and the four models there with, with that project. Um, working with talent's vast. I guess it depends. You know, on, on smaller shoots, we brought in our friends, uh, gave people clothes back. Um, bought dinners and, and drinks and all the rest of it to keep people happy and do some modeling and as time developed and went on we've kind of obviously got into paid shoots and people bringing in models um, to the higher end jobs where you're working with higher models or you know um, celebrities and such and um, it does it does get easier throughout I feel if you can start with your friends and family uh, partners and travel films and, and such and you slowly move into um, commercial work it only gets easier throughout because you'll start to realize that models can really bring something to the shoot um, from movements to style to attitude and um, yeah, it's endless. So following on from shooting, we're going to uh, now have a look at a film for the North Face. This is uh, an SS19 or a Spring Summer 19 shoot that we did and um, it was in collaboration with JD Sports. Yeah, so that was uh, North Face SS19. And now we're gonna move on to something that, um, well, it's not controversial, but it, it was something when I first started writing talks and seminars that a lot of friends that I asked if they thought was a cool feature, uh, they disagreed with. But after the first kind of um, talk I did at the UK Photography Show uh, back, I think that must've been about three or four years ago now, um, the response about um, the influences and people writing down notes and, and taking shots on their phones of the screen at the time um, was really good and was what I wanted from that and uh, I guess really I kind of wanted this to be more about people that influence me and our company rather than just me talking about myself throughout. So firstly we've got Charles Berquist. Charles is a uh, LA based creative. I guess he first came to light for me when uh, we won the Sony camera and we were shooting slow motion work and he'd already got a slow motion reel but shot with a, a much more expensive ARRI camera. 
but um, it was just done so well and I looked at his website and saw his stills and his film work and the commercial work he was doing and it all just made perfect sense to me you know like just the framing the lighting the times of day he shot I just instantly thought he was like an ultra talent and um, I followed his career since throughout so yeah from from the smaller brands that he was doing with jackets and sunglasses he went on to work with much bigger clients like Vice Ghostly Records HBO and he shot a wide range of stuff from documentaries to b-roll for television and I think now he's kind of gone into having his own studio in LA and he shoots a lot of title sequences and slow motion work for uh, HBO um, yeah I'd highly recommend checking out Charles's Charles's work so moving on then there's Rob Choi so I guess I'd already seen Rob's work he, he did a project like run the night for Nike I thought that was really cool because he was working for such a big brand like Nike and he'd shot it in such low light that you never really saw much of the trainers. It was more kind of like visual storytelling throughout the night running in LA. And it just kind of blew my mind how he'd kind of took something as simple as a trainer advert and made it almost like a mini movie. So the images, the, the lower left image and the upper right image uh, are taken from that. Yeah, just a really cool project and I feel like it, it really kind of kind of turned a corner at that point where it wasn't really, it was a commercial shoot but it wasn't all about the product, you know, it was more like the visual message from it. And there is shots of the shoes in there but, but very minimal. Um, the other reason I added Rob is, I mean obviously he's really successful, he's worked with McLaren, Nike, uh, Toyota, Lexus, but um, also, I'd say around three or four years ago, I, I watched an online interview with him when he shot for a really small watch company. He was saying he really wanted to get into car commercials and car work. And within about a two year window, he'd somehow fast tracked that and had produced this beautiful lower right McLaren piece, which I, I'd, I'd highly suggest um, searching that out. It's, it's classic Rob style of work, very dark, very moody, um, aggressive, um, but you know, works in a, in a, in a commercial, um, shoot like that yeah just just really impressed how how talented he is and how successful he's become in such a short period of time you know and he's had goals and he's achieved those things um truly inspiring to me um not to include too many car guys but again mark jenkinson mark seems like a really cool guy i i messaged him about some work that he shot on instagram and he got straight back and we kind of got chatting about it all uh very modest you know just just super nice and really like top of his field, like he, I've, I've seen online pieces written about him saying he's the go-to car guy in the UK. Um, he shoots all of Audi's like main adverts. Uh, he's worked for Porsche, Mercedes, Bentley, uh, and won a lot of awards along the way. Obviously th these lower images here, perfect examples. Two Audi R8 adverts, uh, a couple of years apart, but the, the left with the exposed rear engine, which I'm sure a lot of you will remember really simple really cool concept and then to the right a more recent audi r8 advert uh, where the car donuts in a large warehouse and produces the audi rings um, really really cool so yeah just maybe another one to check out mark jenkinson and lastly solomon lifem so, so solomon um i guess a, an obvious choice in a way he's very big in the film world now in the commercial sector uh, but really cool, uh, does a lot of podcasts, put a lot of time and effort back into learning via Musicbed, via his website, via his social content. He's just been someone who I've watched rise and rise and rise and, and is very cool throughout, you know, takes the right steps, does the right things. I've seen him leave big production companies and thought, what's he doing? And he's just gone on to greater things. And throughout, always per, uh, shooting personal projects. And I think that to me, was was the really cool thing was as much as he's say uh, i'd seen a podcast with him and he was doing an audi commercial but he just wanted to fly to to france to go and shoot his personal project that he, he got lined up and i thought that that's really cool because i'm still kind of at that stage where i want to shoot the audi advert but i'm seeing the guy shooting the audi advert wants to go back and just shoot his own thing and i, I just think that's really nice and kind of grounding you know that what, what could be better than shooting what you want to shoot? You know, this is all about creativity and art at the end of the day. And um, sometimes I guess even the biggest clients can get in the way of that. But yeah, uh, a great person to look into, um, featuring a lot of podcasts, uh, just done a new uh, video with Musicbed. And um, yeah, shot with Audi, Nike, National Geographic. And uh, 
I, I'd definitely jump onto Vimeo and check out his personal projects. Really amazing work. Okay, so from influences, we're gonna move on now. Um, this is to the next film. This is Raised by Wolves. And uh, this is an autumn winter 19. Uh, Raised by Wolves is a Canadian brand that we worked for for quite a few years now. I'd probably say about two or three years. We've shot various projects for them and campaigns. Um, this one was shot on Route 66. Um, really exciting location for us, one that we'd pinpointed. We'd been on Route 66 to shoot a much more polished diner for a brand and we broke off and had lunch at this location. And um, yeah, the town had just kind of gone to disrepair, a lot of abandoned buildings, quite quirky because it still lived in at the same time, a lot of RVs and trailers and scrap and trash all over the place. Um, but definitely more our thing and a brand that we like to work with. So we kind of uh, drafted up a bit of a, a story and background to it, pitched that to the brand. And uh, yeah, we, we went out to Route 66 and shot this project. It's kind of a dream project really um, for, for myself and Jacob. Uh, so he took the stills, I shot the video work uh, and we did it in a day. Uh, we even did some narration as well with the, the model. Yeah, just felt it really came together really well. And now we're, we're kind of doing um, fashion film festivals uh, this, uh, this year. <laughs> A feral child is a human child who has lived isolated from human contact from a very young age. Feral children may have experienced severe trauma before being abandoned or running away. Sometimes the subjects of folklore and legends, typically portrayed as having been raised by wolves. So that was Raised by Wolves. I'm going to finish off now with the last film. And uh, this is For Those Who Sin, The Hollywood Cowboy. Um, this was a, a joint, I guess more like a personal project. Uh, there was no money involved in this project. We worked with Alex Michael Miller that owns the brand. And um, we were just fans of the brand. We spoke with Alex. He's a tattoo artist and he tattooed Jacob uh, when we were out in LA. And then that kind of grew a relationship to the point that we wanted to work together. And we decided we were gonna shoot a bigger project than we normally would. It was more like a, a, a mini film, I guess, with stills. And um, yeah, Alex came up with the idea for the Hollywood Cowboy. And uh, it was just great. It was kind of very imaginative. It, it ran away with uh, way beyond what we'd normally do on a shoot. And it was really exciting. So we kind of stayed in a little motel in uh, Joshua Tree. Uh, we spent the night camping. Um, it looked like he dug up a body at one point. He had this briefcase and we were doing tracking shots with the motorbike. It was just really exciting. So, and to use a lot of different gear, like for example, I guess with the tracking motorbike shots, uh, we had to go autofocus, which I'd never normally do. But, um, the continual autofocus system on the uh, Sony Alpha cameras and the autofocus um, speed on the Zeiss Primes was so good that it made life really easy. And Alex did, uh, we did some low light shots um, up in the Hollywood Hills, tracking the motorbike weaving around all, all the tight roads there. And then we also did the open roads in the desert uh, around Joshua Tree and uh, 29 Palms where this is. And uh, yeah, it worked really well. So it was nice to experiment, expand and do different things with uh, what was essentially a personal project, but would be released as a commercial project at the same time. So yeah, for those who sin.
So I hope you enjoyed that one. Bit of a longer piece for us. And uh, yeah, I just, so this really is my last full slide now um, for this masterclass. And um, just discussing a little bit more and reflecting on how your photography skills can work with videography. I guess for myself originally, uh, the initial step was, yeah, I'd hit record on a camera and film some, some video clips. I guess more so uh, looking towards more professional work or something I wanted to put out online. I started working with time lapses. So I took the landscape still work that I was doing, a bit like these top images here, and I pushed that into some time lapse work. And obviously now on newer cameras, you have that built in. It went from kind of being an add-on to being an app to now being built in in the camera bodies. And it's really easy to use. Um, you know, it's it's really nice to play around with. You just need a tripod and a camera. You know, film in the environment, the sky, whatever it may be. You know, or a sports event, or, or somewhere with a large crowd. And um, yeah, just kind of capturing that moment and that time. Um, it works really well, and it's it's really interesting to make kind of a, a video out of stills, essentially. Uh, and with the new cameras, you don't even have to piece it together. You can do that within the camera body itself. So, so that might be an initial step to shoot some kind of film work and then, and then maybe edit or change or adjust some of the timing and speeds within that. Uh, and then from there, obviously gimbals now uh, are really accessible. You've got really cheap, smaller gimbals like the, the Ronin S now and the Ronin SC. Uh, fantastic bits of kit. Um, we use the, the DJI Ronin M. Um, in all honesty, I just find it a bit smoother than the single-handed ones, and I wouldn't really turn up to uh, a big commercial shoot with a small single-handed gimbal. I just feel um, it looks a bit more like a Explorer holiday type setup, you know, like light small kit. So I just think you're getting more stability on the two handles or, or the center top handle to go really low. And um, yeah, again, a, a gimbal is a good way of adding kind of cinematic movement and being able to do more than just the regular kind of time-lapse or, or uh, tripod video work. Saying that, I still try and take a lot of stills uh, when I have the time. These lower images here, the right is from a commercial trip to Dubai, and I did some long exposures off our balcony at night. It was a great view, so uh, that worked well. And then to the left is uh, Tokyo. We were there for a fashion shoot. And again, I just wanted to kind of document the city a little bit where I had the chance to and when we scouted. So, uh, oh, again, actually that's, a, that's our balcony window. Obviously just a beautiful time of day and, and worked well. So again, these types of shots I, I send back to Zeiss and uh, Hoya, Sony, etc. But yeah, kind of mixing across the two, you know, where the equipment works for both. So, so why not utilize that? Um, I guess the big thing, Moving from stills into video is maybe more the storytelling aspect of it and the camera movements. And it's just something you'll build over time and you'll get more comfortable with. You know, don't shy away from it. Um, shoot projects with your friends, shoot projects with your family and, and just, just build into it. You know, or, or reach out to brands or um, hotels, restaurants, um, small companies, coffee houses, uh, barbers, and you know, shoot bits and pieces. Um, weddings, again, um, great subject to shoot. Um, quite stressful, I think, personally, with all one take work. But um, yeah, you know, there's so many different things now. Drones again, another another way of shooting uh, video content and working with stills at the same time. So Q and A. I think this is uh, we're doing a live Q and A. So if anyone's got any additional questions now, I'll, I'll stay online a little later. And if anyone wants to hit me up with that. And uh, lastly, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I want to say a large thank you to, to Wex for this opportunity. I want to say a large thank you to Zeiss for all their continued support. And uh, also briefly just to uh, Sony and Hoyer as well, who, uh, who have supported us throughout. So thank you all. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I hope we return and we can do more of these. Uh, I'd love to take you beyond and further into film work or um, landscape photography work. Thank you. <laughs>